Hello everyone, it's me, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and person who loves to talk about money. And one thing that we've talked about a fair amount on the channel and elsewhere when it comes to money is how so many norms of American life have really, really negative impacts on our finances. Now, to be clear, a lot of the economic problems that Americans face and that trickle down, ooh, yikes, uh, to our everyday sort of consumer and financial habits are policy driven, right? Like the fact that childcare is so expensive is a direct result of policy decisions. And the fact that banking is essentially unregulated in a whole lot of ways and allowed to ride roughshod over individual retail bankers and faced almost no consequences after 2008, which has had all kinds of disastrous effects, is also in and of itself a policy question. Politics is a huge part of money. And politics is also a huge part of what we're going to be talking about today, but it's not the only part. As I said, a lot of the issues that we face when it comes to the financial lives we're living stem from pretty uniquely American norms and cultures and aspirations. One of the most popular videos we ever did on TFD uh, was all about various sort of grown up purchases or life moves that are ruining people's finances. And for a lot of Americans, one of those things is owning a big house in the suburbs. It's not quite as much of a norm as it used to be. However, it is still for many, many Americans considered not just something aspirational, but kind of a rite of passage when it comes to becoming financially solvent and an adult and having a family. Now, there are a lot of issues in there, right? And we are actually going to be doing a small series on the American suburb and the impact it's had on our money in the future on the channel. But it's not just some of the stuff that we talked about on the video, like the fact that while American families have been getting smaller, our houses have actually been getting bigger and we're using less of them as a result, but they're necessitating way more energy consumption. It's also where these homes are placed. The fact that it's considered a default option for every house to have not just a garden, but a yard, and we can get into yards and we will, doesn't just mean that the house you're paying for and the lawn that you're having to water is bigger, it also means that you're farther apart from everything. There are huge swaths of the country with basically no public transportation, no sidewalks even, and very, very little way to get around except for driving cars. And as a result, for most Americans, having a car is one of the largest day-to-day -day expenses that they carry. It's not just the car itself, it's also the insurance and the upkeep and the gas, which is increasing for many Americans, a huge, huge strain on their weekly budget. And it's also not just the suburbs. I live in New York, which is amongst probably the best in terms of public transport and infrastructure that we have in our country. But I go to Los Angeles at least once or twice a year, every year for work. And trust me when I say that I am often going on 45 minute walks in that city where I'm like barely encountering a sidewalk and I'm in danger of getting hit by cars the entire time. So it's not just an urban versus suburban thing. And it's also not just a certain kind of person. Car culture and the culture of more importantly, not investing in public transit or even considering really walking or biking as a default option has all kinds of hugely negative impacts on Americans' finances. And also, let's be clear, and perhaps even more importantly, the environment. My guest today is a co-host of a podcast that is entirely about rethinking and unlearning this American obsession that we have with the car and with driving. We also happen to be recording on a day where one of the most accursed of all the accursed New York Times columnists, Ross Douthat, Douthat? Whatever it is, I don't care, wrote an article about driving essentially being an sort of an essential component of the American soul and ethos. We'll get into that article uh, and all of the other stuff I'm talking about. But first, let me welcome my guest today, Doug Gordon, co-host of The War on Cars. Hi, Chelsea. Thanks for Hi. having me. This is great. And before we get started, I want to thank Avast for supporting today's episode of The Financial Confessions. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. Thank you for being here. Um, so quick question, obviously we kind of teed it up as far as how this pertains to people's finances, but just to kind of get a little bit more about who you are, can you talk about your background, but also why in particular you came to specifically hone in on this issue. Right. So professionally, I work in television, uh, communications, media. I grew up in a suburb of Boston and 
It was entirely car dependent. Which one? Uh, Andover, Massachusetts. And um, as soon as I got my driver's license, I drove into the city with friends, parked the car, and then would walk around or take the tea. And I had a lot of family here in New York, and I was always drawn to cities and city living. And that sort of sparked my original obsession with maybe this, maybe I'll be happier in a place where I don't need a driver's license, I don't need a car just to have fun. And uh, I've always been obsessed with, with New York and moved here the first chance I could. I love that. And so you live in Brooklyn? Yes. And would you say you mostly get around on bike? No, it's funny. So I am a bike activist and that's that was my entry into this world. And I started thinking about these issues because I was biking to work and there would be a bike lane on a street where the day before there wasn't a bike lane. And I started to think, well, how did that get there? Who put that there? Who in the city makes that decision? And that sent me down a rabbit hole of bike activism. But I would say I'm mostly a pedestrian. I think most New Yorkers are pedestrians first and foremost. And I rely on the subway about as much as anybody else. I took the subway to come up here too. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I well for context for um the audience who may, who I mean I'm sure how many of you guys are following me on Twitter? Hopefully not that many. But um I actually have been recently really getting into using my e-bike as much as possible. Um do most I would say of my commuting um on e-bike. Google Maps now defaults to the bike distance uh when That's recommending good. where to go. It's very cool. Um but when I talked about it and I was just sharing some you know, tips that really helped me out in my first couple of months um, and help, you know, kind of get over the fear, which I think a lot of people have, and we will talk about that. Um, you know, people really recommended that I speak to you guys because you're not the only host and, you know, you were gracious enough to come. Um, but what's interesting to me about sort of what you talk about and what we're talking about here is that part of it is, like you're saying, the bike infrastructure, all those things, which now more than ever I'm very aware of is important. But a lot of it is also sort of the public transit side of it and really sort of thinking about who gets it, who's entitled to it, should Amer should that even be cons something Americans are thinking about? Um, and I'd love to hear sort of what it's been like talking about these dual issues and specifically how it intersects with people who don't live in these big cities where we have so much access to this stuff. Yeah, I mean, living in New York and being based here for the podcast definitely skews the conversation. I think that's true of you know, San Francisco. That's true of D.C., uh, Boston to a lesser extent, Chicago also. These are the places where a lot of our media is based, a lot of our entertainment is based. And so it kind of skews the conversation. And 99% of America, you need a car. You just need a car as sort of your general entry into society to feed your family, see your family, go see grandma on the weekends, uh, go to work, go to school. And so there's this sense, I think, that public transit and living a life where you can walk everywhere and bike everywhere is like this elitist thing. Right. And to some extent it is because the places where it's easiest to do that are obscenely expensive, especially right. as we face a housing crisis all over the country. But um, we sometimes then ignore the people in the rest of the country who can't drive. And that's a lot of people. That's children. That's elderly people who have to give up driving. That's people with disabilities or health issues that prevent them from driving. Um, so there's this assumption that the dominant culture in America is driving, and that is certainly true to a large extent. But there are lots of people in small town America, in rural America, who do not drive for their daily needs and can't. And so we're trying to um, move the conversation towards, like you said, a relearning or an unlearning of an American way of life, so to speak. Before I moved to a large city with a lot of infrastructure, I had an incredibly fraught relationship with driving. I got in several accidents. I actually ended up getting my license suspended. I got arrested because I was driving on a suspended license. It was a whole thing. but. Basically, in the last few months before I um, left the country for a couple years, I was in a suburban area that, without a car. And it really was, um, to your point, such an 
a massive awakening of how hostile so much of the country is to people who are not necessarily even looking to bike around or walk around, but just trying to like get to work. There's almost, even buses, there's almost no infrastructure. Um, do you think that this is something that you see? Because in my area where I was, it's pretty blue. The entire It's pretty progressive yeah. comparatively, but it was still suburban. Do you see a lot of overlap between um, politics and specifically transport infrastructure? Oh, it's nothing but politics. I mean, how we move through the world is the result, sort of like you were saying in your intro, of political decisions. It's not just preferences that people have. It's policy that's made from on high, from elected officials, from lobbyists, from the automotive industry. And so every conversation that we are having about cars on the war on cars is a political conversation. It's a cultural conversation as well. Um, and the way that we got here 100 years or more after the invention of the car is through a series of political decisions. Um, I highly recommend all of your viewers and listeners uh, read Fighting Traffic by Peter Norton, historian. And he talks about what happened at, you know, in the 1910s and 1920s when cars first came on the scene and how there was a huge pushback. Cars were coming. They were seen as elitist toys because only wealthy people could afford them to maybe like get out of the city to go to a country home or go for leisure drives on parkways. And cars were killing average people. Here in New York, lots of children were dying all throughout the country. And there was a huge, huge pushback against that. And what then started to happen, because the car companies knew they had a problem on their hands, was a political push to change the narrative, to change the culture. And, and it's a really long story, but that's where we get things like jaywalking. There was no such mm. thing as jaywalking when you don't have cars. You could right. just walk. There are no crosswalks. There's no traffic signals. But the auto industry pushed this. And so, you know, flash forward to the building of the interstate highway system, of the subsidization of the suburbs after World War II, of the oil crisis in the 70s, where we sort of like the rest of the world said, hmm, maybe we should rethink this car thing. But America said, no, nah, let's double down on it. Um, these are all political choices that we've made, which is good because political choices can undo some of these decisions as well. What do you say to people who argue that all of this talk about public transit and uh, increasing bike lanes is ableist? Yeah, that comes up a lot. And I, I wouldn't want to take away from the people who truly are car dependent through not through not through choice, but because they are physically unable to ride a bike. But I think social media and a lot of these discussions tend to just it's either like the fit guy on the bike and the person who has no physical ability to do anything else other than be driven or drive. And there's a lot of physical disabilities that aren't visibly manifest. Uh, cycling infrastructure can be used by people with disabilities in, in mobility scooters, for example, in electric wheelchairs. If you build the right infrastructure, you can open up your streets to more people. We tend to focus on ableism and fitness because a lot of the infrastructure that we're building still requires like a certain level of confidence and fitness that not everybody is privileged enough to have. And if you go to the Netherlands, like we joke on the podcast about somehow it always gets tied back to Amsterdam or Copenhagen, um, you will see lots of seniors. And in fact, I think the statistic is something like the senior citizens, people over the age of, let's say, I think 65, make up one of the largest groups of cyclists in the Netherlands um, because the infrastructure is safe. And that's the exact opposite of what you see here. Right. Here it's, yeah, it's young, fit, usually white men. Um, and so if you build the infrastructure, you open up cycling to the types of people who internet commenters or uh, you know, even well-meaning people with questions will say, you know, it's not for people other than the fit, it's ableist. And uh, like I said, I think you need to be sensitive to that when you're building cycling infrastructure. Too many cities do a horrible job of listening and, and centering people with disabilities in their infrastructure choices. I mean, just try navigating the subway, you know. Or and, the and sidewalks right, in a lot of Right, right, exactly. And, you know, um, many of our sidewalks still don't have curb ramps, right? Right. Um, and our subway stations don't have um, elevators. But um, those are examples of, well, if you change the infrastructure, then then things change and open up in ways you never could have imagined. And, and the same is true with bike infrastructure, for sure. 
Uh, and as a last note on that, I would also say, and this is something that comes up a lot when it comes to economic questions, and I mean, really any question that is ultimately about policy, which so much of what we're talking about is, is that ultimately policy is always going to be imperfect, and it's never going to serve everyone equally. But when we're thinking about averages and what is beneficial to the most people and is most helpful, and we're speaking specifically in terms of health, mental, and physical, it is absolutely inarguable that a heavier reliance on walking, bicycling, and public transit for Americans would be a huge improvement in terms of American health. And I really think, actually, to bring it back to not just bikes, he has a great video about how awesome it is to drive in the Netherlands because the only people who are on the road generally are the people who need to drive for that trip. And that, you know, right now in America, if you are physically able, you are not going to uh, ride a bike to go get your milk because it's dangerous. But if you made it so that the, those who are physically able to take other means, something other than a car, if you make it safe enough for them to do it, that opens up space for the people who need to drive. And you totally. can go to neighborhoods in the Netherlands and there are no cars parked on the street except for the cars with like the disability placard and that's it. Um, and so when you build a city that's better for walking and cycling, it's sort of counterintuitive, but it actually can become a better city for people who absolutely need to drive. Well said. Well said. And it reduces the mental health load of having to sit in traffic on a daily basis, which is a huge issue for yes, American Yes, that's like health. another hour long discussion. Totally. Yeah. But it literally lowers people's lifespans. That's not even an exaggeration. Yeah. Um, which is better environmentally, living rurally and sustaining yourself with gardening but needing a car, or living in a city but not needing a car? We need a carbon footprint calculator. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know like those specific examples. I can say uh, that living in the city car-free, like New Yorkers have a lower carbon footprint than our suburban counterparts because, you know, I live in a thousand square feet and what it takes to heat or cool my apartment is less than what it takes to heat or cool a five bedroom McMansion. And we don't have a car. If I lived in the city, my wife would probably, if I lived in the suburbs, my wife would probably have to have a car. I would have to have a car. And then when my daughter reaches age 16, depending on where we're all going during the day, maybe she'd have to have a car. So, you know, by virtue of living in the city, um, you have a lower carbon footprint. That doesn't mean there aren't people in cities like fabulously wealthy people with giant homes and you know, vacation homes outside of the city who don't have a massive carbon footprint. But, you know, if we're talking averages, then, yeah, city living is better. I don't think we need to choose between, like, the rural cabin in the woods where you're living off the land and you're completely off the grid and, you know, a 42-story apartment building in, in New York. There are lots of places with, you know, uh, Somerville, Massachusetts with, like, great density and great transit and maybe you also have a little backyard and a garden too so or philadelphia right places like that st louis um chicago suburbs like i was mentioning so you know we don't have to it's not so either or often what keeps us in this weird lockstep is getting super hyper you know nitpicky about individual choices you know yes. because ultimately a as we've discussed on the channel before many times like the environmental problems that we're talking about, the issues are structural. They're policy driven. They're, you know, related to corporate regulation and decision making and all these things. It's not to say you should totally abdicate personal responsibility, but getting in the weeds about your various sort of meticulous personal choices, I think, is kind of missing for the forest for the trees and also really letting off the hook what are ultimately the responsibility bearers, which are in most cases things like politicians. Yeah, and look, every individual case is different, right? Like that person might live in a rural area because that's where they grew up and their family is there and they're not about to like pick up and lose their whole social network and their family connections just because they think it's greener to live in Manhattan. Um, and yeah, you know, what I always say is whether I ride a bike or not is gonna not going to make any wood of difference in terms of... Uh, you know, whether we survive climate change or not, but whether I advocate for bike lanes in my neighborhood or at least don't stand in the way of them, that can make a difference. Um, if we can get more people doing the things that are necessary, the lifestyle changes that are necessary to deal with climate change, getting more people on bikes, for example, um, great. But if you have personal circumstances that mean you have to fly, you have to drive, whatever it is, you should not be racked with guilt over such things. 
I would agree. And we have some questions here about that I'll just kind of blend together, but about the American culture of individualism being a huge driver. And this was, again, referenced in that cursed article as a good thing. Um, The American culture of kind of hyper individualism and sort of moving towards your own little mini domain, your own castle, essentially on your own plot of land with your own cars and all of that as being the paradigm that we're moving toward. Now you're someone who has multiple children who's chosen to still live in an apartment in a big city. And that's often the sort of inflection point at which a lot of people choose um, single family homes, Mm -hmm. they choose cars, they choose all of these things. Can you talk a little bit about your own experience and advice for moving away from that individualism, even when you're doing things like having a family? Yeah, I mean, look, and there's no one size fits all solution to any of this. And we've been lucky to live in a place with like decent schools and, you know, safe streets and things like that. And if we lived in a different place or if our economic circumstances were different, we might have had to make a different uh, a different choice. But, um, you know, this notion of freedom, well, the notion that people I guess I'll, I'll, I'll roll it back and say this. Lots of people for years would say, oh, when your kids, when you have kids, you're going to move to the suburbs. And then we didn't move to the suburbs when we had kids. Oh, when your daughter ter- is a teenager, you'll, you know, move to the suburbs. Well, she's 12. She'll be 13 this fall. Like, we're not moving anywhere. Um, th- I think everything in life involves trade-offs. If we lived in the suburbs, like I said, we'd have to have multiple cars. I'd have to mow the lawn every weekend or pay someone to do that. Like, all of these things that I don't have to worry about now. And yeah, I have not a lot of space, but like I said, my daughter can just go out when she wants and we can do whatever we want around the neighborhood um, to each their own. I think like if, if you want the big house in the suburb, in the suburbs, great. When we talk about like individualism and freedom and things like that, I think we see this a lot with like we, we've talked on the podcast about the similarities between gun culture and car culture that mm. in America, there is this idea that you have a freedom to carry a gun wherever you want that you have a freedom to drive as big a car as you want, wherever you want, whenever you want. Well, I think we should also have a freedom from such things. Like yes. we should have a freedom from the fear of going to the grocery store and thinking someone could walk in here at any time and start shooting. Um, and I, I know that sounds extreme, but we should have the freedom from crossing the street and thinking at any moment someone could barrel around this corner and just knock me over with their SUV and kill me. And I think there's a lot of freedom when you do not own a car. Um, My sister-in-law, who I love dearly, they live in the suburbs of Milwaukee. Um, She and my brother-in-law, they were chauffeurs for their children up until both kids turned 16. I've never had to do that. I've never had to be the chauffeur for my kid. And the amount of freedom that I have as a parent, you. I can't put a price tag on that where I'm saving time and saving money and not having to be behind the wheel of a car all the time. So again, I know I'm rambling, but like notions of individual freedom, uh, really, we have to ask what kind of freedom are we talking about? A freedom to do whatever we want or freedom from the consequences of everybody else doing whatever they want. And um, I like to live in a society where people feel that freedom from fear, that freedom to live their lives as like outwardly expressively as they want and um, feel safe doing it. And I think city living and some forms of small town living allow for that. It doesn't really allow for that if everybody's in a car kind of fending for themselves. I think that's really true. And it's also, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, people have a hard time imagining, especially as they have families. And again, I get it all the time too, with my husband and I living in a two bedroom apartment, um, is that is the inability to imagine living in such small spaces. And as I mentioned in the intro, houses and cars, by the way, are becoming Huge. bigger and bigger. I mean, I'm sure you guys might've seen the photos now of some of these new pickup trucks out where you can't even see a like eight year old child standing in front of the car because they're so tall, the bed of the truck. Um, but houses are getting larger and larger too. And increasingly we're having fewer children. So we're using fewer of the rooms and we're having more and more and more rooms and closets and attics and, and finished basements that are, full of things and and space and resources that we're not using. And I do think, 
it's also an interesting shift, especially from someone who does have two children and has had them for some time now, to sort of imagine a version of that in an American culture that's so heavily predicated on consumerism to make a choice where you literally just can't consume that much. Yeah, we have a rule in our house, like anything comes in, something goes out. Ooh. And uh, I mean, it's not really a rule, but it's sort of like a general philosophy. Um, look, I mean, like, you know, I know I'm not in a therapist's office, but like we are sitting on two separate <laughs> couches. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a suburb and we had a huge house with rooms we didn't use, with an attic full of stuff that, you know, the stuff we didn't use went into. And uh, when my parents had to sell the house, there was a lot of talk of like, well, do we get rid of this? Do we get rid of that? Like, that was hard, you know, and yeah. a lot of it was stuff that... Uh, I didn't really feel any sentimental attachment to it all, uh, but yet I had to waste all of this mental energy, like thinking, where is it going? My parents had to deal with it. Uh, you know, yeah, we have to be very judicious about like what we consume, what we bring into the house. I don't have two couches. I've got the one couch from Ikea, you know, because it's front and center in our living room. Um, and we don't have the rec room in the finished basement where I would need all this other stuff. So yeah, you know, city living is expensive, but then there's a lot I don't have to buy to make it work living here. So yeah. I bet on the average, especially, we'd have to do the math, but I bet it washes out for a lot of Yeah, people. I mean, I think, you know, housing prices now for anyone just getting, you know, moving to the city, like any city these days is outrageous, but- um, A lot in of the term, suburbs are too. Though. Right, and the suburbs now are too. But I, in terms of what we've actually had to do to furnish our home and make it livable and make it work, like, yeah, we don't have to spend that much money. And then I don't have an attic full of stuff. I actually have to- Think about getting rid of it. You know, when you talk about the origins of these things, it is really interesting how much we take for granted that these things were not always the norm. And I think for Americans in particular, car culture has become so anchored in how we think of America and what we aspire to in America that, at least for me anyway, it's kind of difficult to imagine America without cars. Like, I just really don't think that that's easy to think about. But I also think that for the way that cars have become aspirational, and this is something that, you know, we're all based in New York at TFD. So we have a tendency to forget because most people here, I don't, I basically don't know anyone who owns a car at this point. But for a huge portion of the country, a car is a status symbol. A car is, and having multiple cars, and sometimes you park your car in front of your house so people can see it. Um, and from a financial perspective, what's so compelling about that is it's almost literally the worst investment a person can make is a new car. There are some exceptions to that. You know, you can have like collector cars and a few things here and there that will appreciate. But for the vast majority of cars that people are purchasing, especially again, if they're new, all they're doing is costing you money and depreciating in value. Yet they are still sought after so sort of vigorously as this aspirational tool. And I'm just kind of curious how you think that we got here, that it's not just a necessity, but it's kind of um, a status symbol for people. Well, I think sort of like I said before, there's the political side of it. There's the cultural side of it. Um, we did an episode on the phrase uh, America's love affair with the car, which is a thing that rolls off the tongue of news anchors, of just people in general. And that was a creation of, of motor companies. And it was a, actually an, sort of an infomercial uh, with Groucho Marx, and it was pushed as this love, America has this love affair with cars. Um, so there's a huge cultural component. You think about cars in movies and all the, the special cars in film that you can think of the, off the top of your head, like the Ghostbusters car or Kit from Knight Rider or the Back to the Future car. Like cars have this really important place in our cultural story. They're the backbone of industry for a lot of this country, for, for Detroit, for the Midwest. Um, the middle class and unions are sort of built on the auto industry. And so it has this stranglehold on our country, on our ideology, on our just general sense of, of self. And you're right. Yeah, they are a huge status symbol because I think, you know, it's funny. Um, I work in television. And when I was first starting out, I had a choice. I move to New York or move to Los Angeles. Mm. And I knew I wanted to come to New York for a lot of reasons. But one of them was like, I wouldn't have to buy a car. Yeah. And my friends were like, no, you should come to L.A. It's so much cheaper. You know, you can get an apartment for so much cheaper. And then I remember saying to a friend, well, how much are you spending every month on your car? Right. And how much he was spending every month on his car was the difference in rent between L.A. and New York. And, you know, because he was buying more car than he needed because it was a status symbol. It was how he presented himself 
when he arrived at a restaurant or arrived right. at work. And New Yorkers, how do we present ourselves? I'm not the best example of this, but we present ourselves with fashion or, you know, certain other aspects of our personalities. We don't need to make this big splash right. um, with our cars. And, and that's sort of how cars become a status symbol. When you are isolated from other people, it's the first impression you make. No wonder people invest so much in their cars. That's, that's separate from it being the cost of admission into society. Well, that's true. And listen, I'm going to choose my words really carefully about Los Angeles because I don't want any of the... Oh, I love LA. I love going there. I'm just thankful that I don't have to deal with the daily driving. Well, um, listen, I, I love a lot of people in LA. I'll say that. But um, I have a lot of my... Some of my best friends uh, live in LA. <laughs> um, but, you know, what's interesting about LA as an example of an American city... Now, Los Angeles is a pretty unique one because it was built... Um, you know, so heavily on the film industry and so, you know, from day one sort of built as a car centric uh, sort of concept, the way that a lot of it is currently. Mapped Although, sorry out. to interrupt, like it's a, it's was trolleys, right? It was streetcars. And part of the sprawl oh, in true. L.A. comes from the fact that streetcars could kind of take you out to all these different places. And then, you know, development would grow up around that. When the streetcars go away, now you have to drive between those. And, you know, if you're so it's it, well, drag yeah. me first of all. You're right, but also we can say it was never a walkable city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like unlike you know most East Coast cities where they were built back when people were on foot or on horse, essentially, <laughs> um, or I guess on penny farthings. At some point, there is just really not. It was never intended to be a city you walk around. Um, but it is interesting to see sort of the unique nexus in American life that, you know, I think there are probably fairly few cities in most of the world. There are probably, there are others, but it's rare to find a city that large, that dense and highly populated. It's like 9 million people um, where everyone owns a car and you have to drive 45 minutes almost everywhere. Um, because I think for most people, what they would seek out in an urban environment is not having to do that. But it's like, we just don't even think in those terms. Yeah, and it's funny because I lived in Atlanta for two years after college, and my commute to work would take me 20 minutes or it would take me an hour and a half. And I was just... Oh, just traffic. Traffic, right? Or if it... it I remember one time it, it snowed like this much, and it just shut the whole city down. And uh, little things like that could really upend your, your day. And I hated it because I had a taste of what it was like to live in New York or go into Boston. And so as soon as I could get out of Atlanta, no offense to Atlanta, because I liked a lot about it. Like, I love the food. I love the culture, the people. Um, it's a really vibrant city. But the driving just drove me crazy. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to get people to see that piece of it, because cars are just all around us. It's what we're used to. Everybody is born into it. So like we've been saying, unlearning that is, is part of the, the process here. It's also, I mean, for what it's worth in these big cities, like Atlanta is another actually excellent example of a city where you have so much of a metropolitan experience, but you do have to drive everywhere. But I think, you know, to take it back to that god awful article that Ross Douthat put out in the New York Times today, that's basically, you guys, I'll link it, but it's basically, um, you know, Amer like America's ethos is like driving and that's the ultimate, you know, way to see it and that's adults drive and that's just the way it is and just, I, it's so unbelievable to have like a weird conservative backward take on that. But suffice to say, like his example was taking a road trip with his family and what's interesting about it is that Yes, I think most people, even you know myself and my husband, who are don't like cars, don't drive for the most part, will like a road trip every now and again. I love a road trip. Who, yeah, I, love, I go trip. camping every summer. I've taken the cross country trip. It's great. It's really fun. It's great. But as people pointed out in the comments, I think really you know astutely is that like on a day to day level, even people who own multiple cars mostly hate the car experience, like the parking, the moving the cars, the valet, the commuting, the traffic. Um, but yet, I feel like in most areas outside of places like New York, there's just not a ton of political agitation to find better ways of doing it. It's such a gargantuan task in much of the country. I mean, right. you know, we're here in New York where just like a few little policy tweaks can make things safer and get more people on bikes. Like there didn't used to be bike lanes on 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue, not far from here. And now, I and now there idea. are. And that enables people like yourself, right, to go out and get on a bike who might not have before. In the suburbs, it's a bigger task because if you don't have density um, and you don't have that critical mass of people who are agitating, like you said, for better transit, safer streets, or even just sidewalks, 
um, it can be much harder. You know, a lot of our listeners are in small towns and we get emails from people who say like, I always thought I was the weirdo in my town. I found my people. Thank you for the podcast. Um, but that's what a lot of people are up against. They don't have this built in density that can sort of lobby for change together. And yeah. Do you give recommendations on your podcast for people who do live in fairly car centric areas of like small ways in their day to day life that they can become less dependent on cars? Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned that you got an e-bike. E-bikes are a real game changer if you game live. Changer. I mean, they're they're great in cities, but I really think the biggest potential is in suburbs and rural areas yes. where they flatten hills, you don't get sweaty. Um, you know, if you can find those kind of quiet roads or off street paths, like that can really uh, change everything for you. So I think getting an e-bike and replacing, you know, I, you, a lot of people think, oh, you guys want to ban cars. You don't get how most Americans live. It's like, no, what we're saying is that Cars have their place, and they have their place in cities to a certain extent for the people who really need them. They have their place in the suburbs and rural areas who, for people who are entirely dependent on them. But if you can replace a handful of trips, like, oh, I'm out of milk. Oh, well, the grocery store is like a mile away. What if I bike there instead today? And you replace just one trip a week, two trips a week. You start to see that adding up in terms of savings of you know gas Maybe you feel a little better because you're getting a little bit of exercise. So I think if you live in those small places, like that's a really great individualistic way to have fewer, I don't know, less exposure to cars in your life. So I want to take a quick pause here and once again, thank today's episode sponsor, Avast. As a digital first media company, digital safety is extremely important to us. And today's sponsor, Avast, has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. That's a lot of users. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy no matter who you are, where you are, how you connect, or your budget. Avast One offers both free and premium options. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And just a few of the amazing features they offer are things like firewall protection, which keeps your personal information secure and prevents attacks that seek to access our computers and steal our data, or ransomware protection, which will secure your personal photos, documents, and other files from being modified, deleted, or encrypted by ransomware attacks. Some of you may know that my husband is not only a cybersecurity professional, but also just a bit of a tech nerd in general, and he is always getting on me about protecting my data and my precious digital assets, and Avast is great for doing both of those things. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month, and with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your digital presence without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And now let's get back to our chat. You know, it's funny that you say that you save on things like gas and possibly, you know, not needing to go to the gym because you're getting a workout kind of organically. But you also totally save on how much stuff you can buy because that is one, I think, underrated aspect of why cars are so intrinsic to the American experience is because they're the perfect vessel for consuming. Like, you can fit so many groceries in a car. You can like, it's always so funny when I talk to like a friend who lives in the suburbs who's like, yeah, I'm just going to go to Ikea and pick up, you know, a, a dresser or a desk. I'm like, what? With, at, on your back? Like, how are you going to get it home? Well, they put it in the back of their car. Yeah. You know, and in many cases, they own these big SUVs where you can, you know, you could buy out an entire living room's worth of furniture and strap it on there. And I just, that to me, I think is another way to sort of rethink it is not just, you know, spending less on the actual transport, but not just being able to come home with a trunk full of crap every time you drive. Yeah. And, you know, Americans waste a tremendous amount of food. Like, we throw out a lot of fresh vegetables because I think people make that suburban shopping trip and they buy the broccoli and the spinach and the apples and then they get to the end of the week and they realize oh I've purchased much more than I needed to and now it's gone bad right when you live in the city and you live you don't even have to live in a city like Manhattan but when you have like a corner market and you can just get what you need to make dinner that night and then tomorrow get what you need to make lunch or whatever you spend less, you waste less. Um, you know, I joke when I do my grocery shopping by bike, it's like a game of Tetris. I have to sort of figure out where everything's gonna fit. So I have less room for the impulse purchase of like the pint of ice cream that I probably wanna get. Um, and that saves me some money in the long run. Do you guys talk about the intersection of cars and specifically sort of the American suburb? We do. I mean, we, we've talked to lots of people about 
Um, we have lots of listeners in suburbs and just, you know, the suburbs don't exist without cars. The cars don't exist without the suburbs. And, you know, I, I also think it's important for us to define what we mean by suburbs, right? Because there are suburbs right around here, a lot of the suburbs in Westchester or, you know, from Boston, Brookline, Massachusetts, the sort of streetcar suburbs that grew mm-hmm. out of a time when people did really come into the city for work and then take a train or streetcar home. And those are types of suburbs that are great. You can walk around them. You don't need, your kids can walk to school. You don't need a car for every last uh, trip. You know, I'm thinking of like some of the Chicago suburbs are a good example. Um, But then there's the like sprawly Atlanta exurb suburbs where garages are front and center on properties. Parking lots are huge. There are strip malls. And you do need a car for every last, uh, every last trip. And so, yeah, we do talk about those places and what it can take, what it could take to fix them. Yeah, I want to, again, similar to Los Angeles, I want to be sensitive because for what it's worth, like, I mean, listen, I live in a two bedroom apartment. I'm sure many people listening be like, I could never. And rightfully so. It takes all kinds. But I think it's really important that you make the distinction between the type of sort of natural outgrowths of metropolitan areas that have existed basically as long as America has existed at some of these suburbs. Um, And I think it's almost kind of, like you say, a misnomer to categorize them in the same way as you do a lot of these um, planned developments where there is literally nothing that can be done without a car. Although I guess with an e-bike, maybe sometimes now. Um, but the other issue is that a lot of times they're completely separated from any kind of, um, central area without going through like an eight lane thoroughfare, essentially. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the development? I think we've all seen the pictures of like those streets where it's just like Exxon, Burger King, whatever, whatever, (laughs) that are really kind of not just an essential, it's like a uniquely American thing, but it's also like an essential component of these exurbs that we're talking about. Can you talk about how those kind of even came to be? There's a a really great writer, former planner, Chuck Marone, who runs a a site and a group called Strong Towns uh, that's worth checking out. And he calls it the, the type of road that you're talking about a strode. It's not a street, it's not a road. Like it it has the function of a highway, but it serves a more local purpose. And it does neither one of those things Mm. well. Um, It's meant for the fast movement of, of traffic, but it gets carved up by driveways for, you know, entrances to strip malls and things like that. And so it becomes a nightmare to drive because you have to be on alert at all times. Nobody likes walking there. If they have the choice, they're not going to walk there. And so much of American development is predicated on like running these strodes. Yeah, these like three, four, six lane highways through just like residential areas. And they don't serve people who want to take the bus, who need to take the bus. Um, And they're just unpleasant places to be. Um, And you're only going to these places if you have a reason for going. It's like, well, I know I need to go to that nail salon or that hardware store or that big box store then you'll go. They don't facilitate the sort of like lovely small town or urban just wandering. I need to go to the nail salon. Oh, there's the wine store. I'm going to go pick up some wine. Like that's a much nicer way of being. And look, to each their own. If you love being in your car, great. If you love your big house, great. There were certainly times sort of like you're alluding to uh, during the pandemic when I wish I had more than a thousand square feet and two kids. That's huge. Right? Oh, you have two kids. Two kids. Yeah. Um, So, but But, you know, my daughter could like go across the street and go to the park and meet up with her friends and I didn't have to drive her there. And she walks to school and my son, you know, could walk to the corner and get some ice cream if he wanted to. So that's a different sort of I'm rambling and I'm far away from your strode from your strode question. Um, But yeah, you know, so it's sort of like I was saying before, the original sort of early American suburb is great. It's a really pleasant place to be. And and you can have mixed use development with apartments. And then behind that, you can have multifamily homes. And then behind that, you can have single family homes. And it's all walkable. But we have built, like you were saying, a place where it's all just these giant single family homes separated by yards. And there's no cohesive street network that's easy for, you know, a nine-year-old kid to walk to school by herself. Nothing is cooler to me or more intimidating than lifelong New York City kids who are just like 12 on the subway, just like, 
I'm just going to the movies and I'm gonna go meet up with my friend. I'm like, you are so yeah. cool. <laughs> you were mentioning that that terrible column, uh, and Ross is talking about the sense of freedom he had and independence he had when he got his driver's license at I'm assuming age 16. My daughter started walking to school alone when she was 10. Yeah, uh, you know, and that's a real freedom. She was able to get on the bus. And like I said, go meet a friend across the street at the park. That's freedom. Freedom to like not ever have to worry, where am I going to park? Um, am I going to get injured on my way? Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm in my 20s and I'm drunk, how am I getting home tonight? Things like that. That's it's to crazy. me real freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, I mean, the thing about it that you're talking about, like you mentioned, you know, you can be walking to one thing and kind of do, oh, well, maybe I'll do this. And that is its own trapdoor to consumerism, let's yes, be clear. For like, sure. that, and not that I've not fallen victim to it, but there is also a sense of, even with my bike that has a basket on it, or if you're walking somewhere, there's a real limit to not just what you can take back, but also kind of what's important for you to do because it takes a lot of energy. And in some cases, if you're walking time to do things. And I do think there's also um, a really sort of, it's almost too easy to do a bunch of different things that you don't necessarily need or want to do when you have a car. Like when I had a car, it used to be like, well, I'll go to Target and I'll go to, you know, get some fast food, which I, that is one thing I really miss from a car is eating fast food alone in my car. I was like the one. Really That's what the road food. trips are good for. I got to yes. admit. Yeah. Yes. Although you're never alone on those. I want to have a good, sad, <laughs> sad, like, you know, Chick-fil-A meal in the rain, in the silence in my car, listening to a podcast. But Outside of that, though, there is just really, I think, a very, um, and again, I think this ties into a lot of consumerism, is that it's not only easy to bring a lot of things back, but it's also very, very easy to do way more than you necessarily need to do because you exert no physical energy to do it. Yeah, I mean... And especially in America, where you do, if you're walking or biking, sometimes have to think like, well, if I go this way, is it dangerous? And if I go this way, is it safer? You do have to put some mental energy into trip planning when you don't have a car. In a way, if, if you drive and you live in the suburbs, you assume that that grocery store has parking and I can park there. Right. Um, but I actually kind of joke and say that like one of the reasons I love living in the city and I love walking and biking is because I'm really lazy. Even though it takes effort and energy to do these things, like I don't want to have to think to myself, oh, I got to leave early to get there because what if the traffic's bad and where am I going to park? Like when I'm on my bike and Google Maps tells me it takes 23 minutes to get to where I'm going, it takes 23 minutes. Um, when, you know, I need to walk somewhere and it says it's going to take eight minutes, it takes eight minutes. But when you're in your car, it can take 23 minutes or it can take an hour. an hour and then you have to worry about parking and then you have to worry about when you come back will there be, will there be parking you know especially in the city like on my block or something like that so I like to do these things and live this way because I don't really want to ex exhaust any mental energy into like how I get around and what I'm doing and I can just go out and do it and then come back um, there's also the we talk about like money saving but time is money right oh yeah I never had to worry about Am I getting home in time to relieve the babysitter or pick up the kid at daycare? And if I am late, I'm going to get charged more. Like when I was on my bike, I was always at the door to daycare at 5.59 p.m., always. And so that kind of savings, uh, it saves you money, but it also just saves you a lot of peace of mind, I think. It's really a, a much less stressful way to live. Also, as it pertains to cycling, New York is so far behind other places, even in America. Like, I don't know. I'm sure you know about this, but like, I think it's Boulder that's doing a like e-bike program where they're like. Yeah, Denver is doing an e-bike rebate Denver. too. Yeah, yeah. Boulder well, might they, have one too, but yeah. yeah. But basically the city's like, we'll essentially reimburse you to get an e-bike so that everyone has an e-bike. And like th those kind of things. And I think it is, I mean, those are still sizable cities for sure, but I think it is kind of important for people's mental shifts to be like, okay, it doesn't have to be a New York or a San Francisco to no. be making these changes. No, and you know, you think about the like stereotypical Norman Rockwell, like American small town, like Main Street USA, USA those are really walkable communities. And like part of the reason we, we idolize them is because of the cohesiveness of like being able to just walk to the ball field from your house and the sort of stereotypical, I don't know, like little rascals lifestyle of like kids running around all over the place. Right. And that, but that doesn't exist in a lot of American suburbs today. So yeah, it's not about like turning every city in every small town into San Francisco or New York or Chicago. It's like the little tweaks that we could make to just make it so that it's easier if you want to not have a car. You know, another aspect of it that I think gets 
it can often be used as to, you know to be a bit shamey and i think this is where people can be like okay well this is just really a, a smug but you know the, i think the most sort of exaggerated example that alludes to the incredibly negative health impact that car culture has on America, which it objectively does, is the example of someone driving to a gym to go sit on a stationary bike, um, which is obviously extreme, although I'm sure it happens millions of times every day around the country. Um, I'm sure that's not unusual. But there is, I think, a really interesting sort of intersection between the three, the sort of trifecta, and I'm sure it's not like an active collusion between the fitness industry and the car industry, but it is really interesting that Americans have become so accustomed on the whole to really getting very little passive exercise throughout their day and then dedicating specific time and money to get that exercise, which is just not as common in a lot of other places. No, um, there's a great video from this guy, Jason Slaughter, who runs a channel called uh, Not Just Bikes, which people should check out. And he has a video about um, he has a video about how the city is sort of his gym. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I think the thing is, you know, gyms can be really intimidating places. Like, I'm not a big guy, and I feel intimidated going in there. And so depending on your body type, your fitness level, maybe you don't want to join a gym. Maybe you can't afford it. But, you know, movement is really important. Totally. Um, not extreme exercise. You don't have to be running miles every week and, you know, biking everywhere. But just movement is really important. And if you can get that because you take a flight of stairs to get to the subway, because you walk to the corner to get your milk when you need it, like that's, like you said, all this passive exercise. I mean, just my day to day, I walk to the subway and then walk from the subway to a doctor's appointment and then walk to go get lunch and then walk back to the subway to come up here and I'll probably take a city bike home. And I'm not really thinking about that as exercise. I'm thinking I just have to get to my next thing. Right. And that really has helped me and I know it helps a lot of other people just get the necessary movement that they need. I will say on that note, so two things. So it is very easy to get a lot of steps in New York. I will say that. But I've been on the 10,000 step a day journey for, it's been a year now. It's been 15 months now, every day. And a lot of people will be like, this is very hard in places that are not New York. It's really hard. That is true. Do not get me wrong. That is true. However, especially if you even partially work from home, like there are a lot of days when I'm not getting those 10K steps outside. It's snowing. It's pouring rain. Like all of that stuff. Even just not sitting down when you work or even just taking, like you're saying, the much smaller trips that would be very, very easy to. And in the case of New York, we have cars too. I catch cabs quite a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's just, I think, a mindset shift of needing to sort of retrain your brain to just as much as getting away from the cost and logistical aspect of cars, getting away from the idea that movement should be a dedicated time in the day. Yeah. You know, even again, when you're working. But similarly on that note, I will say switch to an e-bike, like rather than taking the subway, uh, you know, or um, cars. And I was wondering, I was like, will this have any impact on my fitness? Because it is an e-bike. But here's the thing about e-bikes. You do not have to use them as like mopeds. Like you can definitely like, it just helps you a little bit. And I've seen really significant fitness changes from even using an e-bike every day. So if you're considering using a bike and you're like, well, I'm not gonna get any exercise on an e-bike. Yes, you do. And you can also choose how much assistance you're getting. Yeah, and also there's like all these great studies that show that people who use e-bikes, you know, there's this stereotype, oh, e-bikes are for lazy people. No, they get people on bikes who might not otherwise be on a bike in the first place. They get people out of cars, so that is like you're automatically getting a little more exercise by not driving. And they also find that people who use e-bikes tend to go farther. Oh, yeah. Right? Because there's just you don't have to think about it as much. You don't sweat as much. And so the, the kind of net result is that a lot of people who use e-bikes are getting the same amount of exercise, if not more, than people who otherwise would be on quote unquote regular bikes. So that is absolutely great. true. Yeah. That is absolutely true. And also I will say for people who are considering it, and I do want to just talk quickly about like getting over the hump of being into biking, because I think even a lot of people who live in areas where it would be possible, like myself up until a year ago, have quite a lot of hesitations about it. So I want to talk about getting into it. But um, yesterday was 100 degrees almost. I biked to the dentist and then biked to work and then biked home and I was never that sweaty. Yeah. The entire time. It's a hundred degrees. I used to bike to work when when going into an office was was such a thing. And I remember showing up in the lobby of my office building and I had biked there on a city bike and my coworker was just drenched with sweat 
And uh, I looked at him. I said, you took the subway, right? Because he was waiting in the Those subway platforms. platform. Yeah, they're terrible. And the biking, I was able to choose how fast I could go. There was a nice little breeze on the bridge. Um, and, you know, you just kind of blot yourself off with a handkerchief or something. And I was good to go. Um, yeah, that, that part of it is kind of, I get that that's sometimes people's fear that they're going to sweat too much, but no, e-bikes especially eliminate that. It's amazing. I like, I totally agree. I sweat more when I take the subway. Um, <laughs> so for people who are interested in, um, so let's say they live in an area where maybe they have a car. It's not, you know, New York level hostile to car ownership. Um, and they could be biking more, um, but they're just like nervous, scared to. Aside from e-bikes, are there other good things to know? Yeah, I mean, I think the best advice I have for anybody who, and I get these kind of messages all the time, I'm thinking of biking, what should I do? Um, find a friend who yes. rides a bike, even casually, and say, could you go out with me? Like, I'm thinking of riding to work. And if you are thinking of riding to work, have that friend on a weekend, like simulate your bike commute right? So that you don't have to do it at the most, at the busiest time of day when there's going to be lots of traffic out there. You don't have to worry about maybe, you know, showing up sweaty to work or anything like that. You can just see how it feels. Um, even in a really busy place like New York, they're really calm, easy places to ride. So pick out those places. But yeah, my, my number one advice is like, grab a friend. I'm sure these days, everybody knows somebody who bikes. And if there's Anything about bike people is they're super enthusiastic, almost evangelicals for the cause, and they're really willing to help out someone who wants to join up. Some of them are assholes, I must be clear. Yes, yes, um, yes. Some of them are But not like, your friends, not your friends. Not your friends. Yeah. Um, also, like, if, okay, anyone who's judgmental about e-bikes, they're out. They're just like, yeah, don't they're, not, they're not even a comrade. You're not part of the cause. You're not part of the anti-car cause. Well, there's a lot of gatekeeping in any subculture. That's true. And uh, definitely in bike culture, it has its subcultures. And that sort of like, oh, e-bike's not really, it's not really riding a bike. That's a, its own form of, usually comes from like white dudes. But it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's its own form of gatekeeping. We don't need it. A thousand percent. Also, for what it's worth, again, I have an e-bike. There are days where I don't turn on anything and I just get the full workout. And by the way, those bikes are way heavier than a lot of bikes. So they're actually more work to pe to pedal than like a much lighter bike uh, when you turn off all the assistance, especially if you're carrying stuff. But I will say a lot of people, and this was myself previously, when I thought about cycling in urban or even suburban environments, I was thinking of like a bike messenger. I was thinking of like, and if you go on YouTube and you look at some of like cycling through New York City, those people have a death wish <laughs> there because a lot of it becomes about showing off it becomes about you know doing really really high risk things getting you know cutting as many corners as possible to get where you're going and like that is not i think for the vast majority of day-to-day -day commuters the experience of cycling in, a, in an urban environment no like if you want to see the most diverse group of cyclists in new york city my recommendation is to go stand outside of grand central by the big city bike stations that are there and you'll see all types of people from all different types of backgrounds, all different ages, like getting out of the trains and coming and picking up a bike to go for that last little leg of their trip to their office. And yeah, so I think the online culture of cycling, the people who are getting off the train at Grand Central are not posting their epic rides to YouTube. No, they're not. Also, <laughs> I would say it's not what I do necessarily, but especially if you're a commuter who's looking to replace part of your commute, those bird scooters, I think, are a really good option. Yeah, e-scooters are great. Um, I was also, yeah, that, I was going to say, you know, bike share it exists in lots of places, totally. even small cities. And so if you're thinking, I don't know if I want to get an e-bike, it's a big financial investment. It's still, even with rebates, can cost a lot of money down. Just get a day pass or a weekend pass for an e-bike system. Uh, borrow a friend's pass if that's possible. And just go try it out. Totally. Also, fun fact, depending on where you live, a lot of e-bike shops will let you try them. Like you can rent the one you're considering yeah, buying. Totally. Um, you know, it's not going to be the exact same one. Like you're renting the, a different one of the model, but you can go try it out for a week. See if you like it. Yeah. Um, which I think a lot of people really don't consider. And I and again, I, I want to stress that up until a year ago, I was one of those people who didn't consider these options. Um, and I would also say as a last note in terms of kind of rethinking it, I think one of the things that is an underrated um, kind of not just benefit, but also mindset shift in um, moving around the city uh, as a cyclist is that you 
in many ways, I feel like I know everything about New York City traffic laws now. In many ways, I feel actually much closer to drivers than I ever did as a pedestrian because you really do become aware of not just the cars around you, but also the very, the massive difference little infrastructural changes can make in an experience, you know? Yeah, I think biking is a, I love biking in the city for as much as people sometimes complain, and that's what what Twitter is for. um, I love biking the city, you get to know the city in such a granular way, totally. even in ways you might not get to know by walking. You know, you, you know, that little bump in the pavement on every block that is on your commute to work, you know it until the city comes back and fixes it. Um, you know, the timing of the lights, you know, I, I should slow down here because I'm never going to make that light. Um, you are able to see stores that maybe you would just zip by in a car or just pass by underground and never have a chance to see. So, you know, cycling um, for all of its stresses and as long and as far as we have to go in the United States to make it the kind of thing where regular folks are just comfortable doing it every day, it's still such a joyous, great thing. I mean, the pandemic is a really good example. People who drove to work were really happy working at home because they were like, great, I don't ever have to get in a car and sit and commute again. People who bike to work or walk to work um, generally had like much higher dissatisfaction with working from home. Yeah. So um, I'm yeah I miss that, and um, I think yeah if there's one thing to take away, it's it's fun. It really is fun, and it is um, so you don't fun. have to get into biking. You just have to get on a bike, and you'll have fun. I totally agree, man. I'm like a little kid now. Anytime there's like an errand, I'm like, I'll do it. I'll take me ten yeah. minutes on my Yeah, bike. I love picking up my kids like in a way that I don't think I would if I had to drive there. Yeah. You know? like, Are you I, bike stroller, Dad? Uh, I have a big Dutch bike made by Work Cycles in Amsterdam, and it carries uh, it carries three children. I have two, um, and we would go everywhere on that. I Wait, mean, that's it's, it's one of the wagon ones. No, it's just it's kind of like a long bike. It has a seat in front for my youngest, and seat in the, in the back over the back wheel, and. Uh, I, I loved it. It opened up the city to us in ways I call it a yes machine because like, oh, a birthday party in another side of town. Like I have to schlep the stroller on the bus to the subway or rent a car to get somewhere. Nope. Just hop on the bike and we go and we're there. So, yeah, that is I, amazing. It's fun. Yeah. Also, this is a really like niche one. But for me, anyway, when I go meet people uh, on the bike for like a meal or something, you, I, at least some people do. I would not. I can't drink. Uh, so that's in New York City, $15 saved on a glass of wine because I'm certainly not <laughs> buying one and hopping on my bike. That's that, what bike share is for. You bike there, you drink, and then you can get home in the safest way possible. Look at that. I'm like a little stressed about city bikes only because the quality varies so much in the that's bike true. you're going to get. But now that I'm much more comfortable with the actual, like, I know the city, I know where I'm going, I feel like, all right, now I can do that. But now you've just eliminated that savings. <laughs> um, uh, but so, okay, so you, t- you mentioned Amsterdam. And one thing I think before we hop into the questions from our audience is the extent to which people, I think, look at um, transport and infrastructure and all of these things, walkability, et cetera, as being innate, you know, or that's just the way that culture is. And, you know, we talk about how we talked about how, you know, America sort of became a car culture. But similarly, you mentioned Amsterdam, like 30, 40, 50 years ago, Amsterdam was full of streets with cars. Like this was a very, very sort of concerted effort to move it away from being a car centric city into being what is now known as like probably the biggest bike city in the world. Um, Could you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, um, there's another great, uh, great set of people that your listeners and, and viewers should be following. That's Chris and, and Melissa Bruntlett. Um, they have a bunch of two really good books on um, sort of how the Dutch built a lot of their cycling cities and the benefits of car-free streets and car-free cities. Um, you know, yeah, Amsterdam was, and I've been many times, in the 60s and the 70s, it was really car-centric. Lots of its streets looked like any street in New York, lined with cars, with with lots of traffic. And there were plans to demolish much of the kind of center city for highways to expedite vehicle flow through the city. And that was pushed back on by a lot of people. There were some really great um, elected officials who pushed back on it. But there was a concerted effort in the 70s by what was called the Stop the Kinder Ward movement, which is literally Stop the Child Murder, because there Mm. were so many children being killed by cars in the city. And it's a huge problem in all of the US. Um, but there's a real concerted effort to push back. And there were protests. And we, you know, to bring it back to sort of where we started, this was a political process as much as any other that turned Amsterdam into what it is today. And yeah, it took 30, 40 years for 
us to get these smiling pictures of Dutch people, you know, riding through the rain with their kids on the back of the bike or whatever. But it was never um, preordained. And there isn't anything, to your point, that's innate in Dutch culture or the Dutch person that there's nothing in their DNA that leads to cycling. You could say the same about the Danish and Copenhagen, which is another kind of cycling mecca. Um, these were policy choices that have made cycling, along with transit use, kind of the default. And that driving is harder. It costs more. They put a lot of fees on buying a car. It's harder to park a car. You can't park a car for free in most places in these cities. And when you do all of that, the bike just becomes this thing that's in the back of your head of like, oh, I'll go to the grocery store on the bike. You don't really think about it. Um, and I, I, yeah, I highly recommend if people have the ability to like to go there or even just look online, like to look at the history of what it took to get Amsterdam to where it is. Um, because like I said, yeah, it wasn't preordained. It took a lot of effort, the kind of effort we're seeing in American cities now. And again, not just in massive metropolises like New York. Um, this can and, happen anywhere. Well, and I would also say people say, oh, but Amsterdam is so flat, right? And if that were true, Florida would be the cycling mecca of the United States. Or, um, oh, but the weather really isn't bad. And if that were true, if that was like the one secret ingredient you needed, Los Angeles would be a great place for cycling. But it really has to do with the infrastructure and how you prioritize the safety of people on bikes, on foot, and sort of push cars a little bit to the margins. Now, if you're disabled, if you're making a critical delivery, you can still drive into the center of Amsterdam. You can still drive into Copenhagen. But if you're able-bodied and you have other means and other choices, driving is not going to be the thing that you're going to default to. And that's that's the key difference. Very well said. And I will say, on that note, uh, not only is it, it, like you say, the the flat thing, even if it were hilly as hell where you live, which it is, I mean, I live in a extremely, like it's a high hill to get to my neighborhood. Um, and it's a breeze on the e-bike. I live so. in Park Slope. The slope is there. And, uh, you know, with you an e-bike, it. Uh, it really makes things a lot easier. Totally. Yeah. But also, I mean, you know, one of the things, I mean, it's just like, we call them Dutch style bikes. I ride a Dutch style bike. And I think a lot of part of what makes their um, culture, like makes it so adaptable is that Dutch style bikes are extremely comfortable. Like yes. I think a lot of people have a misconception because they're thinking of much more uncomfortable type like racing bikes or like God forbid fixies or whatever that are really unpleasant to ride for long periods. But a Dutch bike is like, you could ride that thing for hours and be fine. Yeah, there are people who call Dutch cyclists like upright pedestrians or fast pedestrians. <sighs> Um, Enough of that. And yeah, and um, you know, like, look, this is my cycling outfit most of the time, right? right. Like, I, I have a Dutch bike. I sit up straight, and I'm a short guy, and I can see over a lot of cars. Um, it's it's great. It's a much better way to think about cycling. And yeah, I think the type of bike that a lot of Americans envision leads to that intimidation. It's like the Tour de France bikes. Yeah, the drop like handles or you know light things, and um, yeah, you don't need a bike like that. No, you don't. Um, so we have a couple of questions from our audience that I'd love to ask you, um, or they would love to ask you. Ooh, how can biking include working class or poor families with heavy transit needs? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it is true that a lot of people think that like cycling is this like yuppie elitist thing. But cycling already does include a lot of working people. I mean, first of all, we have lots of people who make their living on their bikes, especially in places like New York, delivering food and things like that. Um, but sometimes, oftentimes, lower income people live in neighborhoods that are historically neglected by cities in terms of the, the investment in bike infrastructure. So I think as a bike advocate, as a white bike advocate, privileged person, how is my advocacy also going to lift up and include the neighborhoods that need as much bike infrastructure, if not more than mine, that, that mine already has. So I think if you bike, you know, really um, get involved in local politics, vote for the right people, like get people talking about how we can share the wealth of bike infrastructure to more places so that the car doesn't become like a default necessity for, you know, lower income, working class people. Um, yeah, I think that's a hugely important part of it. The political side of this is is really big. Yeah, I would agree. And I would also say, I mean, 
uh, upfront costs are a real issue. Yes. Um, although some bikes uh, are not as expensive upfront, and also some can be purchased um, through financing that, you know, some will have like a year of 0% APR, things like that. Like there are options to a- accessing bikes, especially things like e-bikes, which, you know, if you have heavy transit needs, you probably should get an e-bike because you're, you know, if you're commuting longer distances, right. if you're going to work, like all of these things are good for an e-bike. But like, even in my case, I have a fairly, I mean, listen, bikes can be 10 of thousands of dollars literally but my bike was fifteen hundred dollars plus a few extra little baskets and things like that which is expensive like that's not a negligible cost however i am already under a dollar cost per use and it's only going down right you know and it'll probably end up in the pennies because at the end of the day it, it, like we talk about a lot on tfd it's we really need to change our mindset whenever possible again for upfront costs from how much something costs initially to how much are you spending over time yeah um, and theft yeah. is also a really big concern for all cyclists, but especially if buying a bike represents a large share of your income, especially with the upfront costs. And so advocating for more secure bike parking is really important. So maybe someone could bike from their home where they have a secure place to store their bike to a transit stop where they can just leave their bike and then take the train the rest of the way, as opposed to thinking like, oh, I should just drive from point A to B. Also on that note, and I was recommending this recently to someone who takes a train to New York City, but then has a little bit of a commute left to do once they're in the city, is a folding bike. Um, yeah, folding bikes are great. A great option. Or those little scooters. No judgment on those little e-scooters. <laughs> Man, the other day I saw a full-on businessman in a little suit with a little tie back here and a little backpack on his bird scooter. Just like Amsterdam. Look at that. Yeah. I felt so European. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, last questions. Why is America so bad at trains? And why did the Second Avenue subway extension cost so much money? Oh, I mean, I think like to the second part of that question might be above my pay grade of like, why do infrastructure costs, like, why are they so high in the United States compared to other countries? They are absurdly high. Like Paris is building multiple extensions of their metro for a fraction of the cost as it takes us to build like one extension of the seven train to Hudson Yards or whatever. Um, Why is America so bad at trains? Because we haven't invested in them and we've invested all of our trillions and trillions of dollars in highways. And um, it goes back to notions of individualism and and freedom. Um, But it really just comes down to like what we prioritize and what we have chosen to fund over the years. Like we think it's freedom, I guess, to have to get in a plane to go even as close as like Portland, Maine, or, uh, you know, North Carolina, but a train would be much better and probably faster in the end. So a lot of it is just comes down to, you know, what we prioritize and infrastructure. Unfortunately, we can only in America see as highways. That's true. Um, So we have two last quick ones that I want to get to. One is someone asking, uh, they're anxious about taking public transit. Any tips? Um, I understand the fear that people have, because if you turn on the local news or read some of the tabloid newspapers, um, there there's a lot of focus on crime right now in cities and on public transit. And some of that fear, especially I would say, you know, if you're, if you're Asian American is probably justified because there have been an uptick, there has been an uptick in, in hate crimes, for example. Um, but I think, you know, what public transit needs in order for it to be safe is people taking it is lots of people taking it. And, um, I wouldn't judge anybody on an individual level if they do not feel safe taking public transit for whatever reason. What I would say is like, don't believe everything you see on the local news. Don't believe everything you see in the tabloids. Like I I just took the subway here from Brooklyn and made a stop in Manhattan and it was fine. It was busy. Um, And separating the sort of like sensationalistic stories from the statistics can be hard to do in our sort of like, you know, simian brains that we have. But um, I think it's it's not as bad as people think. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of Manhattan and it's like, it's 100 degrees out, but it's perfectly pleasant. People are out and about. It's great. Totally. Also, on that note, to bring it back to cars, people wildly underestimate the danger of riding and It's the most cars. dangerous thing that you can do on a daily basis. It's one of the leading causes of death for children. Uh, I'm sure everybody who's watching knows somebody who's been in a serious car crash. I know people who have been, you know, who have died. Um, It's the riskiest thing that you can do. But, you know, we don't think of risk in that sense. We think of risk as like the scary person who's going to mug us and not like the person on their phone texting someone going through an intersection who's going to run us over. And that's 
that's a thing I think we as humans and as Americans are not great at kind of parsing out the real relative risk of different activities. Well, as I knew it would be, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, Thank this was so great. Much. Thank you yes. so much. Um, where can people go to find out more of what you do? Uh, so we are The War on Cars. So we're available wherever you get your podcasts. And we have a website, thewaroncars.org. And we're also on Twitter at The War on Cars. Thank you. And if you ever want to talk about getting on a bike, tweet me. I'll talk about it. I'll with... go for a ride with you if you're in New York. Give oh, me... my gosh. Yeah, go. Yes. We'll both, we'll both meet up and just bike. You know, we'll be like a mother duckling and you can follow your little duckling. All right, guys. Well, we will see you next Monday on an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye. Bye.